Um, welcome. It's great to see everyone here tonight. I'm John Weber, the director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art here at the University of Oregon. I want to thank everyone for turning out tonight for the conversation between artist Leonardo Drew and Jordan Schnitzer. So thank you, Leonardo, for making the long trek from Brooklyn to Eugene to be here. And thank you, Jordan, for, yay. <laughs> Thank you, Jordan, for sponsoring tonight's event, for loaning all the work in the Strange Weather exhibition that's on view now in the museum. Um, Jordan is also sponsoring Allison Sars' talk here on April 3, and that will be also in the PLC 180, so please stay tuned for information about that. Uh, the highlight of Strange Weather is Leonardo Drew's huge wall installation, 215B, and if you haven't seen it in person yet, go see it tonight after the talk. Uh, we're open until 8.30. And although we might think of this as a work that you could call abstract, um, I would argue that it's the explosive visual resonance also speaks directly to, uh, to, to the world that we're living in now and the unsettling uh, climate and the world, the frightening nature of the time. And as visitors, we're in the middle of the explosion. Uh, I'm sure that Leonardo and Jordan will talk about the installation, so I'm going to resist saying any more, at least until I hear what, what they have to say. <laughs> um, now, before introductions, I want to acknowledge that the University of Oregon and the JSMA are located on the Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties in between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the Coast Reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Celeste Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions to their communities at the UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. And we also express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon. This includes the Burns Paiute Tribe, Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, Umpqua and Sayusla Indians, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, and the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs and Coquille Indian Tribe, the Cow Creek Band of the Umpqua Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. We also express our respect for all other indigenous peoples who call Oregon home. And if you're at U of O, you've probably heard this language before, and I do want to mention that it is um, negotiated by the university with the tribes themselves, and that is why we keep the specific language that we use. This is really, there is a, a VP for governmental relations with the tribes of Oregon, and this language was worked on by him, Jason Yonker. He's also the chief of the Coquille tribe, which is quite, um, quite an honor to have him as one of our colleagues. Um, and I do want to note that a number of work by indigenous artists are on view right now in strange weather, uh, including Wendy Redstar and James Lavador from Oregon, and also Joe Federson and Edgar Heap of Birds, and they are well represented in Jordan's collection. I want to thank um, Professor Nina Amstutz and the UO Art History Department for coordinating us with tonight's event, and also um, welcome Alfredo Haar for his talk uh, that just concluded. Uh, we are going to be doing a reception for both artists after the conversation, and so I hope you will come over to the JSMA. We have um, quite a bit of food and refreshments. You can go up into the galleries until 8.30 and have a chance to talk to the artists and also to Jordan. So thanks again, Nina, for, uh, for this. And it is a small art world, and it actually um, uh, Leonardo and Alfredo share the same New York gallery, uh, Gallery Le Long. Um, so I want to thank some staff members, Tiana Buckley, uh, Will Kingscott, Mike Bragg, and our security staff for supporting tonight's event and getting the word out. Our format tonight is an informal conversation between Leonardo and Jordan with some time for audience questions at the end. Um, they've known each other for a number of years now and, and talk regularly, and Jordan has been an avid collector of Leonardo's work. He began collecting with prints, and uh, now this incredible uh, installation is, is uh, just an amazing piece, and they'll, they'll be talking about it. Leonardo Drew lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. He was born in Tallahassee, Florida in 1961 and grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. He attended Parsons School of Design and received a BFA from Cooper Union in 1985. 
He has had an incredibly active and productive career that now spans uh, nearly four decades. And we'd be here all night if I listed every major show he's had, every grant he's received, every significant collection he's in, and every commission he's done. But a few highlights will give you an idea. He's done artist residencies at the Studio Museum in Harlem and at Skowhegan. His work is represented in numerous public collections, including New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Solomon Guggenheim Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, Tate London, and many more. He's had solo museum exhibitions at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, Bronx Museum of the Arts, St. Louis Art Museum, Mississippi Museum of Art, the De Young Museum in San Francisco, Wadsworth Athenaeum, the Hammer Museum in UCLA, and many more. He shows, as I said, at Gallery Le Long in New York and in Paris, and his next show in New York at Le Long will be in September, with a show coming up after that later in the year or the next year in, in Paris. Uh, he has done uh, major commissions at SFO Airport's Harvey Milk Terminal and for Facebook head headquarters in Menlo Park, California. Uh, he was also in, 19, in 2022 elected a national academician at the National Academy of Design. He'll be speaking tonight with Jordan Schnitzer, who acquired his first work of art as a teenager and whose collection now exceeds 20,000 works, I believe. Um, his family foundation lends works and exhibitions nationwide, supporting artists' careers through purchase of their work in depth and producing catalogs to go with exhibitions. What began as a collegial partnerships with regional university museums has today expanded into an extensive exhibition program that has done over 180 exhibitions of art at more than 120 museums across the country. In 2023, Art News announced Schnitzer as one of the top 200 collectors globally. And of course, he is a University of Oregon alumnus with a long involvement at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, so I'll just conclude by saying go Ducks, go JSMA, go Jordan. Please join me in welcoming Leonardo Drew and Jordan Schnitzer. Let me stand up first. With that introduction, I think we're actually done and let's get the reception ready. <laughs> but, um, this is actually very special for me because I came here in 1971. And I was a business major, and uh, for any of you that remember the computer center over there in Fortran 4, I just hated it. So I switched to English and spent a lot of time in PLC, and especially this room. My favorite professor, Clark Griffith, taught American novel, and uh, I just uh, put him on a pedestal. I can hear him, like yesterday right here, talking about the bell jar, and uh, Fitzgerald, and Hemingway, and whatever. So being back in this room is extra special for me, as it is talking about uh, Leonardo Drew. Um, the biggest print fair in the country is the IFPDA the, uh, that usually is in November. Now it's been changed to February. But years ago, a major person in New York, Dick Solomon, who runs Pace Prints, that does most of Leonardo's extraordinary prints, asked if I would fund a lecture series, which I did. So for around 15 years, we funded lecture series. So he called about 10, 12 years ago and said, boy, have you heard of Leonardo Drew? And I said, no. He sent me some images and I was just blown away like all of you who have seen it are or will when you go over there. And then I came a month or two later and met him and heard his talk and there was just immediate chemistry and I began the wonderful partnership with him to have acquired the largest amount of his work of any collector. And um, um, I've always said artists are chroniclers of our time and as you'll discover in our conversation, he. Uh, totally uh, represents lots of themes and issues and just sheer joy of the abstract uh, constructions that he makes. So with that, since John covered part of your history, what he didn't talk about is that uh, uh, your dad left when you were young and your mom moved to the Bridgeport, Connecticut to the projects and across the street was a city dump. Your mom worked a couple of jobs, all of your five of you went to college, she worked hard but you showed as a young grade school student an artistic talent. And you started drafting, and in fact, uh, when you were 13, Marvel Comics, DC Comics, and Heavy Metal Magazine wanted to hire you professionally to do work. So first, where did that inspiration come from? And tell us that magic moment about Jackson Pollock. Okay. Well, Pick up the mic. Uh, 
Hello. Is that, is that good? Uh, okay, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 were an art, you were an art trial yeah. prodigy, mm. okay? Uh, you were made an offer by all those companies, and then you saw a reproduction of Jackson Pollock. Right. And suddenly you said, I want to be an artist. Well, Tell us about that moment. What happened? Listen, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, to be truthful, uh, if you're born into this as an addict, which I believe I am, I mean, that means a person that actually absolutely has to make. And uh, even though I'm named Leonardo, my mother knew nothing about who, and she says that she named me, but she did not. <laughs> I'll clear that up in a little bit. But, <laughs> you know, uh, actually my father, who I did not know, uh, who was an artist, his name was Leon. And uh, you can just guess. She will never say this is actually true, but the fact is, if you're named Leon, you're an artist, and you have a, your second son, you have, you have the name after you, it's Leonardo, no problem, you know? And only... Sometime later, uh, after many beatings for being named Leonardo in the projects, you know, I mean, that's like, you know, an ass kicking every day, you know. And uh, at the school, it was like I never wanted to sort of like, you know, be Leonardo until I, you know, uh, you know I got into uh, second grade and the nuns told me, you know, oh, like Leonardo da Vinci. And we're like, what? <laughs> there's another Leonardo, you know. And from there, it, you know, the fact that I was already making things. Uh, my mother's like a force of nature, meaning she, if she said, you're not going to be doing this and I'm going to stop you, she was determined to stop me from making. Uh, so if, you know, uh, my mother's a, a strong spirit, uh, definitely an influence, but did not understand. I mean, you got to you know, know that, like if you're growing up in a projects and if someone, you know, in school gives you a test paper and says, okay, this is it's time for a test and you start drawing all over it, it's time for her to stop you from doing that. And, uh, you know, she couldn't, you know. So I am absolutely an addict. Making, making, making uh, to the point where now my hands and everything are starting to give me problems at 62. Uh, knees, need new knees. But it's all about being able to travel, see, take in, uh, and uh, reproduce uh, uh, by way of uh, almost osmosis. Uh, uh, what I'm, you know, like uh, what, I'm, what I'm witnessing. And, uh, you, know, you know, when Marvel and DC approached me, uh, it was, you know, it just seemed the correct thing to do is to use your talent to get, you know, out of the projects. And once I saw Jackson Pollock, though, that was canceled. You know, uh, I had been doing, uh, well, let's go back. I mean, uh, I mean, let's take a look at what my work looked like and what, I mean, you can see here, uh, the stories behind all this stuff, but I mean, if you're drawing like this, I mean, that, <laughs> you know, not to go jump all over the place, and I'm not going to be doing that, but like this image, uh, interesting enough, was one of my first uh, paintings. Uh, uh, it's Captain America. I'm growing up in the projects, and you see that missing button in my uh, a, a coat there. My mother saw that image. It was in the newspaper, and she said, you know, boy, why didn't I, you know, why didn't you tell me, you know, you were going to be in the newspaper, you know, we would have dressed you up, you know. But the truth of the matter is, this political image now is like, you know, it's indelible. It's like, that is, you know, that frown and this Captain, life-size Captain America and growing up in the hood, you know, speaks volumes, you know. This is draftsmanship. This is what Marvel and DC and Heavy Metal were looking at. They said, okay, yeah, we need this guy, you know, uh, uh, working with us. But it wasn't too long after that I saw Jackson Pollock and I knew that I needed to sort of like transition into something else. So moving ahead, you went to Parsons for two years. Mm. And then you heard about Jack Whitten, mm. an amazing black mm. art teacher. Okay, at Cooper Union. At Cooper Union. And there weren't many folks of your color teaching mm. then. No. So you heard about him and you transferred to Cooper Union. Mm -hmm. Tell us about his influence and what that was like and how that changed your career. Well, interesting that when I was at Parsons, um, you know, I really wanted to sort of... My, microphone closer to the mic. Okay, is that better? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, like uh, at, at Parsons, you know, where I started out, you know, uh, you know they did have a program, uh, a fine arts program, but it was atrocious. Uh, realizing that, you know, Cooper had, one, their reputation and also the staff to sort of like you know, answer some of the questions that I had in terms of fine arts, I had to transfer over. And that was when I met Jack, uh, you know, and 
Jack being one, black, the other, you know, like a, a teacher, you know, uh, immediately became mentor, father, and, uh, but he also let me know, after introducing me to a lot of the artists that were out there, um, Joe Overstreet, Mel Edwards, uh, 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 William T. Williams, I mean, just, just a slew of artists who were makers, making things, uh, addicts also like myself, but they were making these things, but there was no venues, no, no, one, no representation, and no way they were in the mainstream. So Jack always let me know that, okay, this is where you park it. This is, you're going to be teaching probably, whatever, and it's like, I never really believed that. Keep in mind that I had already been exhibiting before I met Jack. Uh, uh, it was a different type of work that I was determined to sort of like change and challenge, but the, uh, uh, what, what he brought to the table was, uh, you know, this, you know, undying, you know, curiosity to sort of continue to sort of, even though you were not accepted in the mainstream, there was still the connection to, you know, like uh, uh, the world of, 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 of the larger world of a, of a language uh, that was not inclusive, it seemingly not inclusive, but actually th there are no borders and there are no barriers when it comes to art. So, uh, uh, you know, me standing on the shoulders of uh, someone like Jackson Pollock, the history is still lineal, you know, still lineal. And this is 1984-85 when yeah. you graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to show the work you pushed down the street? And yeah. About <laughs> Cotton Bale. Yeah, yeah, Jack allowed me to use his studio, uh, which was on Lisbonard, uh, and that's me pushing a bale of cotton down Broadway in 1992. Now, th I didn't... You know, I wasn't ingenious enough to set this up as a political statement, but the fact is there was a person that realized that I was pushing this bail every other day, uh, you know, in order to make this monstrosity, which is also, you know, like I said, done in Jack's studio. I'm sorry we don't have the images of that with me in the studio uh, 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 in, his, uh, in his space making this thing. But the, 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 the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, it, 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 it just says, you know, speaks volumes in terms of, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, cotton, <laughs> black folks, you know, I mean, you can't escape it. And interesting also that these bales um, uh, that I painstakingly make, cutting with scissors and gluing together and stacking them, uh, uh, some years, many years later, uh, 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 you know, I was traveling from, uh, from Tallahassee to, to, uh, to Atlanta, Georgia, and saw this field of cotton. In the middle of that field was this bale that looked exactly like this stack, you know? And it was like, I said, man, you mean to tell me there are machines that could do this work? I said, I had, I had not, if I had only known, you know. But, but, but the truth of it is that it seemed like I was always, in one way or another, connected to um, uh, this. Uh, you know, the history is there. Uh, but if you're an artist, there's a door, if you're a black artist, there's a door that you need to go through in order to get at the truth. And um, once I touched that material, it was like, okay, you need to sort of move on, but it was important for me to go through that door. Uh, my voice now, as I'm making things with different materials, a lot of times uh, uh, identifying with different cultures, you know, there's still a through line that connects me to my voice that still pulls us all together. Collectively, we are not, se we are not separate from each other. So when it comes to uh, your journey, my journey, on this planet, we're all related, absolutely related. So, so my work, uh, even if I'm in Jingjin, China, or in Peru, uh, still resonates with a commonology of all of us. So there is never a time when I feel that you know I need to sort of like focus on uh, uh, one political statement. It is actually a mass one that actually incorporates all of us. But referring back to that part of the. American African experience. Mm. In 1992, you were asked to go to the Dakar. 93. Uh, yeah. 93. Mm -hmm. And the you went with, Dakar, some, went with some artists to mm. uh, Dakar, and that really hit you. What happened there? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, Joe Overstreet, uh, who's, uh, we, call the, we used to call him the toothless tiger, but like uh, this mean cuss, a uh, very good friend of Jack Witten's also, from the same generation. Uh, we were all a part of this, the, the first uh, biennial in, in, uh, in Dakar. And for, for black folks, we say going back to Africa, going back to Africa, right? And um, I, you know, I, I, you know, as a young artist, you know, we were talking 1993, it was like, wow, you know, this is going to be, you know, something. And it was. 
because what I ended up learning inevitably was that like through um, as we were getting uh, coming to the country, uh, they treated us as like Americans, and we were like the rich cousins coming back home. It was not the kind of <laughs> you know coming home that we expected, but it was like uh, but it was the truth. Uh, how uh, America has um, how to say destabilized a lot of countries. Uh, it, it, it resonates all throughout. So uh, as a black person going back to Africa, you're not gonna exclude it from the fact that you were an American, you know? And interesting that uh, <laughs> Joe Overstreet, uh, when we arrived at one of the villages, uh, they had this kind of welcome party. And uh, uh, keep in mind that they were always kind of taking things from us and like, oh, you know, you're rich Americans, you know, like, uh, give me that, you know, you, you're, you have everything, you know? And as we were getting to the, coming to the village, it was like, you know, one of these things you do at tourists, you say, hey, welcome back, welcome back. And we were um, getting off the bus, and they were like, what is it like to be back home? And Joe Overstreet, being this mean cuss, he says, well, uh, maybe it was your ancestors put, that put my ancestors on the boat. Something I had never thought about, you know, and never even knew was a thing, you know. But now here we were, he brings up this, this, this issue, heavy issue, but the truth, you know. So... These in inhumanities, you know, seem anyway to sort of like, you know, and <laughs> never ever excludes, you know, you know, if you look like me, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm not going to enslave you. So these kind of like uh, uh, this continuation of monster, you know, atro atrocious acts, you know, uh, uh, um, it was like that. It was like, wow, it's like, uh, you know, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm not sure how they're going to answer that question, but they were pissed off, you know, <laughs> that that was even brought up. But uh, if you read through the, uh, the you know, it's, it's, it's there. And, um, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the uh, uh, other aspect of this, this journey back home was that I had to visit, you know, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Gory Island, which is like one of the dungeons where all the, uh, uh, my answers you know, were kept before they were get put on the boat and shipped here. And uh, you go into these catacombs and it is like, is this thing moving? I'm sorry, is that moving? It seems to be sitting there. You do it. Set it back up. But because I need to get, and when I need to get, get to something. But, but I'm sorry, guys. But um, I'm not scripted, so. <laughs> but, but, the, but, but going to Gory Island, that piece right there um, definitely speaks on that. You know, I number these pieces for a reason. Uh, I believe that these works should act as mirrors that you should be able to find yourself in these works. If I say that there's a, there, there's a common thread that, that ties all of us together, in fact, if you're standing in front of this thing, there's no way that you're not gonna you know, feel or find uh, 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 some common history, some through line that we all are part of. Um, what I found in uh, those catacombs obviously was this, this uh, sort of uh, claustrophobic suffocation. Um, um, uh, this is one of the only times when I actually speak about you know, directly about what my experience was and how it sort of like, you know, uh, uh, became material, you know. Uh, you, you mentioned that you don't title your words, they're mm, all numbered. Mm. Explain why you do that, please. Well, it's, it, you know, you should have the opportunity as a viewer to sort of find yourself, you know, in the work without me actually having to sort of like guide you through it. Uh, you should have a full on experience, you know, I, and I need to get my ass out of the way of that experience. So, so it, it, it's so important, you know, and I have actually, uh, there was a time when I could sneak up on people and ask them questions about, you know, what is it you're seeing or why are you standing in front of this thing, you know? And I would sometimes do this, you know, poke them, you know? Like with questions like, you know, um, you know, like, a, 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 you know, like a, this, is, this is not really art. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and, and the comebacks are always like, you're a stupid idiot, you know? <laughs> I'm gonna and tell you what, you know? So this is, this is, the opportunities to be on the other side and learning as an artist, I mean, I grab at those opportunities. And so uh, if, if, uh, if I get out of the way, that means I can learn. That means I can actually learn about my journey too. Meaning like if I felt, I can't, if I came in believing that I had all the answers, you know, there's not really an opportunity for me to continue to sort of reach, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, possible other uh, uh, iterations, you know. Uh, you know, my traveling absolutely brings that about, you know, where I have the opportunity to sort of 
touching some, you know, touch on some of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, other civil civilizations, cradles of civilization like China, you know, um, uh, going to Machu Picchu in, um, in Peru. Uh, uh, you know, it is just, you know, we're, this planet, I mean, is still full of so much. And if you're an antenna receiving information, then you should plant yourself in different parts of the world to sort of receive that information. It's there, you know. You've told me before when you travel, you like to just experience where you are. Mm -hmm. and then you come back to the studio, and I'm sure people want to know, do you sit down and organize? And mm -hmm. like, I mean, Ellsworth Kelly, everything was mathematically organized. Roy Lichtenstein, all these angles, computers, things, whatever. Mm -hmm. So how do you do your work? How, how's it happen? <laughs> How about his analytical or smart as someone else were Kelly or these artists who have to will map out and understand exactly what it is they're after you know um, and sometimes it takes years for this whatever I experience to come out and it's not like I'm looking for that anyway that, that you know being on foot and being able to be in these places and touch uh, uh, different individuals uh, uh, is, is, is food enough at some point it's going to find its way out you know you're taking in this energy you're going to have to find a way to sort of like you know, uh, you know, bring it out. But yeah, it shouldn't be forced. Like uh, the piece that I did that I said reflects that situation in Gory Island. I didn't, you know, look to make that about that subject. It was just that when it happened, it was like, that's what they, where that came from, you know? But it was like three or four years later after the situation. So it's not like I have to like run, you know, uh, create by way of a uh, of, of, uh, of route, you know, or map. It's not necessary. Do you work on like one piece at a time and get it finished, or what's your studio like? Well, there's usually seven crying babies, I call them, and you rotate those, and they continue to sort of assist each other in realizing, you know, the next piece. So if you're rotating seven things, it's like, and they all need milk, then it's like you're always running around trying to like, you know, accommodate each one, you know? So, so you got yeah. seven, seven works all at the same time. Mm. Uh, when you get up in the morning, and he, he is such a hard worker, you know, I... Uh, uh, put the kids to sleep about 8, and my partner sort of goes and rests, and I start reading the papers. Around 11 o'clock, I'll call him. <laughs> it's like 2.30 in the morning. Yeah, you know, know. He always like answers the phone. He's always working. But, <laughs> but how do you know when you get up and you get in the studio, how do you know what piece to work on? How, what, tell, tell us. The one that's what, crying the like? loudest. The one that's crying the loudest is going to get the attention. So, and, 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 and there have definitely been, people also say that I cannibalize. They, that's the word that I only have to learn, that, you know, cannibalize art, you know. So I will take things that you would consider finished and create the next piece. So um, I believe that within each of these works, they're almost layered with life force almost like layers of, 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 uh, of the Grand Canyon being this kind of la uh, this, uh, uh, layers of history. You know, so the more you touch these things, literally touch them, the more life force they have in them. So that means if it's kind of trying to sort of get born, it probably has the possibility of sort of adding, being a super additive, uh, say like to the next body of work. If you, you know, are brave enough to tear them apart, you know, you know listen, if you, Give me some of that work that you have. You know, I will definitely find, <laughs> you know, new new situations for them. You know, so they they're never really finished. You know, so so you your work looks like found objects, mm. but you use all new materials that you make look old. Why? Why don't you find used old materials and save all that time? Well, I I I have a number of friends who are great artists who actually use found objects. Uh, I choose not to because I need to actually uh, become the weather, I need to become attached to uh, uh, how the creative forces mold things. So I, in effect, you know, have to sort of line myself up with that force, uh, force of nature, and, you know, mimic or create. Well, let's not say mimic. Let's just say uh, we're not separate from nature. We're the nature of nature. You know, we are. We're not, I think the, 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 the problems that we have with, with, uh, with uh, conservation has more to do with the disrespect that the fact that we believe that we're better, we're, we're, we're superior to, and that we have this unlimited supply of material nature that we could continue to sort of glean from. But if you have a reverence and you believe that you are not separate from that thing, nature, then you, know, you, you would definitely be more respectful 
of that and also understand uh, the, the cosmic realities of the situation, you know. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, mm -hmm. when do you know, you're working on seven pieces in your studio, uh, when do you say, that's done, that's perfect, how do you know when a piece is done? <laughs> you guys completed? buy it and take it out of the studio. So, <laughs> I mean, that's the truth of it is, like, okay, you have an exhibition. It's like they drag it out. Believe me, if, that, if I can get my hands, and I have, you know, said, okay, you guys haven't moved this piece. Give it back to me, and I'll do some things with it. So there, there, there's, and there, I mean, there's, there's like silliness, too, that comes with this. Like, the, like Matt, when I go visit, they go like, oh, don't let him near the piece. He's going to take it apart or something like that. I'm not that crazy. You know what I mean? That's, that's stupid. You know, why would you do that? You know what I mean? But it's like if, if I were able to get my hands on it in the studio, yeah, if it came back, then, I, yeah, it's, it, I have the opportunity to sort of like realize, uh, you know, the next realization of that piece, next iteration. Let's talk about, uh, um, you do amazing, unique things, and you've also been doing some phenomenal prints and multiples, some of which are in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Because uh, in your studio, you're working alone. You went to, to, to Pace, and uh, you worked with um, Ruth there, master printer who's yeah, spectacular. Yeah, Ruth McKimmy, my oh, sisters, can, yeah. Can, what's that like? What's that partnership like? Well, you know, let's talk about collaboration. Um, uh, they, they, I think you guys might have saw, seen like some dancers around some people. That's Merce Cunningham. Uh, back in 1996, 1996, uh, Merce Cunningham approached me about uh, collaborating with him. I didn't know who he was, <laughs> so, so I had to check around, you know. But in the end, uh, the the very idea that I not only was able to work with, but I also had the opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, understand his philosophy. Uh, he works, you know, these three different, like a triangle, uh, uh, you know, like uh, he, he, he does the phrasing and choreography, uh, the artist does his little thing, and then there's a musician, all separate from one another, these are separate from one another until opening night. They all come together that, 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 that evening, and then he hopes <laughs> that they all come together to make music, you know, beautiful music together. And for me, that was like, wow, this is that kind of risk taking, um, you know, the, 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 the bravado, the, 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 the ballsiness of it. You know, I was like, boy, I need to get some of that. So really, I've been using that very same philosophy and it transferred into my working with uh, Ruth and Akimi when it came to, okay, your next collaboration, which was the prints. And it was like, okay, these guys are not only master printmakers, uh, all I had to do was to, you know, let them off the chain, you know, allow them to be. And we just made, you know, just some wonderful things. As we know, prints have been Albert Durer 1500 uh, for hundreds of years. But after World War II, a woman named June Wayne opened up Tamarind on Tamarind Street in Los Angeles. And her objective was to create master printers. She wanted to train people technologically to be the best in the business of doing things on paper that never been done. Uh, those graduates went on to so many of the publishing houses and have created just uh, remarkable technological changes to allow artists like this to do things that never could have been done. But to help us understand the three-dimensionality of those pieces you do with Pace, like, like well, I, mean, I should how, tell how you, how that, do you do yeah. that with paper? How, how do you make it work? It, how's, how's it happen? Well, listen, I, I mean, lo love uh, Dick. Solomon and, and Jacob, those guys over at Pace Prince, but they, 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 them, they, the reason, there are reasons really why they approached me was totally mercenary. It had to do with, you know, how do we get prints that actually behave like sculpture? Uh, there's this, obviously, you got, everyone understands that, okay, there's a price point between uh, uh, prints. As magnificent as they are, uh, they're not reaching the same price points as, you know, uh, full-on sculptures. And they said, well, bring this guy in. <laughs> you know, he'll definitely beat it into shape. And I say, but those master printmakers, we're able to, like, you know, uh, do some things that, you know, in the end, you feel like you're, you know, if you're buying art, that you're coming away with, like, a sculpture. You know, uh, uh, I mean, we ended up actually adding to the, the language of printmaking that, you know, something that only other artisans would realize. So when Ruth and Akimi go to these sort of seminars with all these uh, 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 geeks, really, and they talk about printmaking, they say, okay, this is new. And we didn't know that we're, I didn't know anyway that we're creating anything uh, other than just objects, you know. But in the end, because of uh, their commitment, 
the fact that they never said no uh, when I asked them to bend over backwards and sort of like figure something out. Uh, um, uh, we, we, it's it's a now like almost a 13 year relationship uh, with them where we're, we're, we, we continue to sort of like, you know, you know, develop a shorthand for uh, reaching new heights, you know. So it, it's, it's been fun, but I think there's like, a, a, you know, a lot of unanswered questions. And it's really about blurring the line between like these, you know, different factions, you know. For the print fair last week in New York, uh, I actually took a booth not to sell anything, and I uh, featured Leonardo Drew. And the little brochure you all took was a brochure we handed out there. And I called him and said, you know, uh, Jenny Gibbs, the executive director, instead of my doing lecture series again, thought maybe we should actually focus on an artist. And I picked you because you've done prints and multiples, you've done unique pieces, I mean, you've done it all. And then I also asked you, who were artists that you were sort of influenced by or uh, respect, and you picked Robert Rauschenberg, it's in here, Matthew Day Jackson, okay, Julie Maher too, and, and, um, and Hank Willis Thomas. Um, and we had works on both sides of the outside of the booth of those artists and inside 25 pieces of his and the bios of those artists are all in your book that we gave you. Tell us about your relationship with other artists and how you get inspired or what is, what happens with your relationship with other artists? What, 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 what goes on? Well, the, 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 the um, interesting part in this is that not only are we standing on the shoulders of uh, you know, the, this art history, it's, it's this continued chain of, of, uh, of creativity, but there are other artists who are also on journeys, uh, all different but committed. And my relationship with them, usually it, it's, it's interesting, it's diverse and, or you know, really different as our works are. Uh, from each other, uh, uh, there's 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 synergy, there's there, there's uh, complicity, uh, uh, you know, there's a brotherhood, uh, sisterhood, um, you know. So I think that like uh, it, it's it's you know, and it's ongoing. I mean, I can go on and on about some of the artists that you know that that I did not have in the, at Booth, you know, that are that I admire, and uh, it's just that they uh, you know are bravely you know asking questions. Being it up, challenging, uh, and adding to the language, you know, that's really the only way to, I mean, you know, interesting that Art Forum asked me some questions about Jack, as Jack was coming, you know, like they, they found him, dug him up. Jack Witten. Exactly, I'm sorry, Jack Witten. And, um, you know, uh, and they, they said, well, let's go speak to Leonardo about Jack. So it was like, it, 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 and what, one of the first questions uh, they asked was, uh, wasn't it brave of Jack to sort of keep making art, you know, even though he was not getting any recognition? I was like, what the fuck are you talking about, you know? The, he's an addict. He has to make art. It has nothing to do with whether or not you guys accept him or whatever. <laughs> Hung up. <laughs> you know, but the truth of the matter is, it's, it's, you know, that was the only way to answer that question. It's like, we have to make art. We have to ask questions. We have to challenge. But at the same time, this is something that we're born into this world already, you know, you know, but this is what we need to get done. And it has nothing to do with bravery, you know. You know, we're, we're so proud in the, our foundation to have done more exhibitions than anyone in the country of women, artists of color, Asians, we have a Global Asia Show traveling, Hispanic artists, whatever. Um, not too many years ago, um, um, I, I and others would not have seen the amazing work by those categories. Yeah. Tell us about that. I mean, and it's been decades too long in coming, yeah. but tell us about your perspective on that in the time frame that you've been working. There's been a, a change in the museum and curatorial mm. world, and, mm. and it's been a wonderful, wonderful change. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, it's been a change, but it's, it's one that's a kind of revolving door, meaning like, uh, you know, artists have been uh, bought in uh, and <laughs> into the mainstream. I, I, I still do have some um, reservations about just, uh, uh, you, know, you know, like I said, art is happening has really little to do with whether or not you're, you know, uh, 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 judging it accordingly to your, 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 you know, what you believe, what you believe, what you believe is uh, art. Uh, we're just makers. We're going to make things. Uh, uh, and we're not necessarily going to sort of stop to ask whether or not, 
<laughs> you know, you know, like, uh, you know, accept. You should not, we should not be asking, you know, you to accept uh, our journeys. You know, you, you, you're, you you know, like on the whole, you're, you can be like, you know, keeping us from actually completing it by just, uh, uh, it's an interesting situation, definitely for black artists. And for, I mean, obviously for any category, you know, that has not been a part or been kept out of the visual mainstream. The actual mainstream, like meaning like Jack knew uh, Warhol, uh, 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 the Kooning, I mean, knew these guys, you know? So there was already this kind of like, you know, trade-off of information. People look at Jack's work, look at, um, uh, what's his face? Um, Richter, you know? And I remember when they didn't know who Jack was, uh, Pam Joyner, a very good friend of mine, had Jack's paintings and uh, w one of these uh, 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 writers from one of the magazines came through and, uh, or I think it was one of the curious from the tape, uh, he said, that's a beautiful Richter. Jack had been making beautiful Richters, <laughs> you know, before Richter. You know, so it's this, there's always this kind of like, okay, how to navigate this? It's like, okay, how do we, do you correct it? I mean, art will correct itself. You know, it's, it's, it's doing that now, you know, in spite of the fact that there were these walls that said, okay, uh, you're, you know, you, you are, you know, you, you are not intellectually um, sound enough to be a part of this camp. Uh, back in 83-ish, uh, MoMA did an interesting exhibition, like 83, uh, called Primitivism. And in that exhibition, of course, they lined up Picasso, Brock, and did you see this exhibition? Well, let's be seen. I mean, you could probably look it up, but it was an interesting time because they thought that, well, we're going to like let people know that, you know, like uh, uh, that these primitives were civilized by these artists, Brock and Picasso and Salvador Dali, you name it, you know. But listen, the artists were not guilty in this. It was just the, 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 the canon or the folks who actually write art history are guilty of actually trying to line up this, or have this idea of, of superiority, and that these artists were civilizing these primitives, had the very opposite effect. You know, because people who saw that were like, oh my God, you know, Picasso. Um, and you look at these masks, it's like, oh, it's, it's you know, like uh, appropriate, we, that's a nice word, appropriate, appropriate it, you know, from these folks or stole from these folks and got this ab abstraction, yes indeed, had its beginnings on the continent of Africa. You know, um, uh, yes, artists do what we, we do, what we do. We, uh, we, we see things, we feel things, and you say, I need to sort of have some of that. I have to figure out how that's done. Uh, I need to get, gather that for my, you know, this is what we do. And so Picasso and Brock, those guys are not guilty. You know, they, the magnificent works came out of them. You know, but the fact is, <laughs> you know, like, you know, uh, from a much, much more powerful source, you know, uh, uh, from oceanic to Native American to, you know, African art. I mean, these folks were connected to what? To nature. <laughs> With re reverence and respect for those things, and that's where the power of those objects come from. Yeah. Uh, I've often said artists are always chroniclers of our time. Now, you've done work that speaks to the African-American story, but also a lot of your work is just spectacular non-political work. But uh, Kara Walker, the Hank Willis Thomas stuff, whatever, um, do you balance that? Do you feel a need to, I mean, a lot of your work, the cotton stuff, other mm -hmm. stuff, my God, it's as strong as anything there is. Uh, just like, my God, the Allison Sarr piece in the show over here, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you, um, do you feel a tug at continue to raise the voice about those issues? Or well, not? Listen, my, my, my brothers and sisters are out there doing their thing, you know, so it's like, this is beautiful, but we need to, you know, diversify that voice, you know, it should, we, we should, you know, you know, yes, indeed, you know, you can touch that subject, but do we need another one on that subject? So, you know what I mean? It's like, I feel that we need to spread that out. So when I was in South Africa back this, uh, this past summer, uh, visited, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, colleges there, and uh, the kids were, um, you know, I, I, you know, I looked at their work and I said, you know, I knew right away. So it was like they were all leaning towards figurative work, 
I said, this is great. But I said, well, who are the abstractionists here? It's like there were very few abstractionists, you know. And I said, that's interesting how the world is flipped. I said, the, the, you know, Af you know, like, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, abstraction is, had its beginnings in that, you know, on the continent, but there are very few of them actually still sort of like gleaning that, you know, that, the, the, the strength of, of, of that voice. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I am in there, you know. You know, I want to <laughs> continue to expand that, 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 uh, that, that, uh, that road, you know. Before we ask for a few questions, since the explosion piece is a centerpiece of the show that people have seen and will see going over there. Can you put it up on, is there, is it yeah, on the screen there? I mean, there's something like it. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. I mean, the explosions are interesting enough. I mean, uh, people, we, this is, this is it, other iterations of that very piece that's here. But so, like, uh, uh, but. To, to tell everybody how, uh, when they look at this thing, they think, my God, where did the inspiration come from and how do you make it? <laughs> I mean, it's multi-layered, meaning, um, Color had not, if you were to look backwards at, you know, the, the works that came before this, color was not really a part of uh, uh, how I approached making things. Uh, the fact is that when I made the decision not to uh, paint and draw uh, anymore, we we're talking eons ago, uh, uh, and sort of try to, try to follow uh, abstraction, um, uh, it, it, just, it just made sense for me to tie my hands and not go the easy route. I continue to sort of use that very same philosophy as I'm moving through, uh, 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 you know, always asking questions and, you know, like when you get comfortable, you know, tie your hands again and then figure out another way uh, to create. Uh, color came about because of my, uh, really my journeys in China and a place called Zhengnezhen, which is on mainland China, it's like ground zero for porcelain. And the artisans there making like uh, gigantic, I think my, my guys might have saw like giant vases, like 25 feet tall. I mean, they have kilns. I mean, they're making monstrous things there. And like uh, uh, there I was um, with these artisans and like uh, they, they, they thought when I was smashing things, they just thought it was trash and they would throw it in the trash can. And I said, no, this is not trash. This, this is art. You know, but keep in mind that they're making these beautiful vases, right? And I was like, well, it's like, oh, they, 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 they figured out at some point that he's an artist. This is um, uh, a probably serious work. Sometime later, Fring uh, uh, said, Leonardo, don't be mad. But uh, I saw your, uh, your work hanging in a, in a clothing store in Shanghai. And I was like, <laughs> He's like, okay, how did that happen? I'll tell they you. Copy, how they copied it. <laughs> oh, no, no. They, 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 it's the Wild West there. There's no copyright. So, so you go ahead and make your work there, and they will make a copy of it. <laughs> and I say, well, I, I didn't have a problem with that, honestly, because I, what did I come away with? Color in my work, you know? And so it was a fair trade off. And so, the kind of things, the kind of things that, I mean, we're looking at right here, you can see the kids, when they get in front of these things, they do, they, I, I don't, I don't, do social media, or it's like, a, but the fact is, this is the real world, and they're dealing with this 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 monstrosity, and uh, I mean, it's 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 a continuation of uh, of of, uh, of of in in a way completing the work, you know. There's complicity. There is there's a the, the uh, crazy, huh? So when I was in the studio, I saw this explosion piece that you'll see. And uh, it was partially finished, and I said, I want that. Not realizing later it was going to take 40 cartons and a 40-foot <laughs> truck just to move it. My gosh. But um, for those of you that were curious, when you go over there, uh, the main center part is componentized in all these pieces, and there's a sort of a instructions as to how those all go, right? Mm -hmm. But then all the other stuff around it, tell us about the artistic license you give the wonderful preparators to do and so what, what, what happens? Well, I mean, I think that, like if I say that you can become the weather, that's not necessarily uh, just me. It's like it's something I need to sort of like, a philosophy that I need to sort of share with not only the audience, but actually the people who are gonna install these things because otherwise they wouldn't know how to properly dance in order to sort of realize these. And they, it, they have to have uh, enough confidence, you give them enough confidence to sort of understand that that it's okay. There's, there's no such thing as a mistake in this piece. And, uh, and you definitely have the license to sort of like realize, you know, uh, you know, you know they, they don't think, just become the weather. 
become the weather. Two last questions. When you walk into an exhibition like this and you see your work, like today when we walked in early and you saw that, what do you think? What do you feel? Uh, I'm sorry, saw what? When we walked in earlier at the museum mm -mm. and you saw your piece dis you displayed a bit differently than it had been in the other, the other four museums it had been in, what did you feel? What did you think? Well, you know, interesting that uh, I, I, there are occasions where uh, the work has left the studio. I mean, we're talking these seven crying babies, they have to leave at some point. So, you know, you, um, you, know, you, you don't have the opportunity to actually fully know what that whole thing was about because you got all this noise going on. I'm, there, look at all that noise. So <laughs> that gives you an idea of what it's like in the studio. The, can you imagine trying to make sense of, you're just attacking. These things leave, they have the opportunity to actually, if, if they're alive, they gather their own, uh, how would I say, their own experiences. So you run into them in different situations and they tell you what that whole journey was about. You can't know in the studio though, you saw what a mess that is. Yeah. Uh, before we, uh, one last question, we'll ask some questions to the audience is, what's your legacy going to be? There's in 30 years, 40 years when you're no longer making art. Don't, like, don't what, worry about what that. What do you want your legacy to be? Do not worry about that. It's, uh, listen, if the, these works, they go out there, they do whatever they need to do. They can disintegrate, do whatever. It's okay. You know, um, but it was important for me, you know, to sort of like to, uh, you know, just to be on that journey. Um, uh, the legacy is something, uh, it, I do feel that it's ego related and um, uh, uh, I can't be thinking about that. It's, it's like that'll happen if it needs to happen, you know, but, but uh, it's not, for me, for me, it's not an important thing. Um, I need to just keep making and keep exploring until I drop. Yeah. As an artist, do you, uh are there some museums around the world that you're saying, gosh, I wish they would have my exhibition? I know you did say the highlight of your career so far is having your piece of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art in Eugene. <laughs> but <laughs> if he wants a ride home, he better agree to that, right? <laughs> I made him breakfast, got him his bed, got his orange juice, everything, pancakes, everything you want. Anyway, no. Uh, no, no. Do you sit there as an artist and say, gosh, why doesn't the Houston or the Tate or some? Uh, do you think about that? Does that. Well, if I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I thought about that, I'd be making it work differently. And, um, and I think definitely, you know, you would park it. When I say park it, that just means, you, you know, you have a signature. This is me. I'm going to be making this type of work, and everyone's going to know it's me. It, 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 they still do, because the vo once you find your voice, that's it. It doesn't matter what material you're working with. It's, it's, it's going to find its way. But, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that the... the uh, uh, you know, I need to, you know, continue to challenge myself. So that means that I, you know, once I get to that point where it needs to become easy or comfortable, then it's time to turn it up again, you know, or to throw that out and try something else, you know. But that keeps life, life interesting for me. But it also puts me in super jeopardy because people want to know that you're, you have a signature and that they, they, people approach me and say, do you have any rust pieces? Do you have any cotton pieces? You know, it's like, well, that's like what I was doing back in the day, you know. But it's not, I'm not revisiting those things, you know. So that, yeah. Not, not a couple of questions from the audience. What do you want to know? What are you going to do, turn, turn that thing off? Yeah, right. Yeah, give us a break on it. Um, I can imagine that uh, whenever you, uh, you walk into your studio in the morning, um, you probably look at your coffee and wonder, wow, is it, you know, is it the caffeine or is it really just what, you know, what's in the room? Sorry, okay. So what, I'm going to yell into this thing, man. Um, so when, the first time I looked at this, I was really impressed by the energy that you know, just really comes out from it. Uh, and one of the things that, that I noticed in it were some kind of recurring objects that almost looked like um, a fretboard 
Uh, what what a, kind of board? Like a fretboard on a guitar or a bass, oh. uh, or something that's more like uh, still a fretboard, but looks like an oar, you know, that you'd use uh -huh. for paddling a canoe or something, uh, or a baseball bat. Uh -huh. And the thing is that you know there's kind of a couple of these that seem to be kind of common features in this thing, that um, kind of turns the the, uh, the the room from static energy into like more of a kinetic energy, mm -hmm. in that the the things that are close to these. These particular objects are like fretboards have a heavier end versus a lighter end, mm -hmm. and it's almost like you know the first things that would come out of an explosion are the you know heavier ends and the tail end following. And as you go further out, um, then it starts to twirl a little bit more, and so mm -hmm. now you end up where you've got something that's got the heavier ends pointing in, you know the other direction. Mm -hmm. Am I seeing something in this that, you know, it, can you comment on that? reference for the natural. I mean, it yeah. certainly sounds like you understand composition, but also how things are made or put together naturally. Yeah. I mean, if you think of a tree, you're describing a tree. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> so that will be, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's uh, it, it, it will definitely, um, you know, always be uh, in a lot of ways in reference, uh, reverence to uh, 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 those things natural. So you're not wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that if you're going to say my voice was attached to a certain iconography, it would be probably the tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can y'all hear me in the back? Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to ask you how your day is. Uh, and then second, I'd like to maybe speak for hopefully everyone here in saying that. No, you're good. Okay. Yeah, that's my bad. Um, I, I would like to hopefully speak for everyone here in saying that um, I'm so grateful to have you here on the campus. And I truly appreciate, um, <laughs> especially, as a, yeah, especially as a person of color, um, it, it's really inspiring to see your work and how it manifests in the gallery, um, especially given the fact that curation nowadays is a practice that is objectively rooted um, in a Western European historical perspective that places precedence on a, um, I guess you could say, similar display of artworks in a gallery space rather than curating the space for the works themselves. And so when I viewed, I believe it's called number 22A or B, um, the one that's in strange weather. Okay. Um, I was there with my art class and first of all, I was astounded, I was, you know, awestruck and kind of the way that your art takes up the space um, and oh okay sorry um, I'm sorry I'm, I'm, I got you okay yeah no I, I mean I'll stop wasting your time but uh, no 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 let's um, hear it I, I'm, I'm following you mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thank you um, I noticed for one you know in kind of the um, how would I say, uh, not mess, but it's almost like there's so much going on. Chaos. It's hard to, yeah, chaos, that's, mm -hmm. that's the correct word. Um, in the chaos, you know, I was trying to almost find and pinpoint um, some sort of central subject. And in, I don't know if this was necessarily my mind going places, um, or maybe this is, my implicit bias, you know, telling me certain things about your art curation, the way your process works, but from what I gathered, I know that you kind of take new objects, you make them look old, and the way you um, talked about how re repetitive interactions with these objects allows you to put this life force um, within them, honestly, like, made part of my question answered mm. in the sense that I'm, I'm wondering if when you're doing your process of painting, creating these objects to make them look old or, or used or have that life force, do you often or maybe you don't try to um, make these things uh, representational? And representational, um, I can be more specific in the sense that when I was surrounded by everything, like I said, I was trying to find this, you know, maybe subject matter, and a lot of the things I was seeing were guns. Um, and not to say that you mm. intend to um, display any of your art in that manner with that subject matter, but I think the idea of strange weather, forced migration, 
Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the trauma that that's caused on just the human population in general. Um, do, you, do you try to make those things or is it just a matter of the way it comes You're out? You're seeing it. You're seeing it. Yeah. Right? Then that's you're seeing awesome. it correctly. Great. You're okay. seeing it because guess what? They're, they're mirrors. Yeah. They're mirrors. These yeah. are mirrors. You're staying in front of, and I can't tell you what you're seeing, mm -hmm. but if you're feeling it, you're seeing it, that's the truth. That's the truth. Does that make sense? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm okay. That is the truth. Mm -hmm. Yes, congratulations on becoming one of my favorite artists. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just amazed by your work. Thank you. I look at your work and I want to know to what degree is your work informed by this glorious, beautiful, amazing, and yet at the same time ugly and utterly unsustainable enterprise called modern industrialized civilization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that those questions definitely get answered um, in the process, how I create, and also uh, reverence for uh, the very things that you're speaking on. You know, um, you know cos cosmically speaking, there is no way that, that there's not a, there is a cosmic clock and it's ticking. And uh, the earth is gonna be okay. <laughs> We're not gonna be okay. But well, everything's gonna be okay. So all this worrying about like the environment and all this other stuff. Get good luck. <laughs> it, 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 it's it's it, those the, these concerns are human concerns. Ask the dinosaurs. You know they will tell you <laughs> that yes, indeed, it's a cosmic clock. Your time is up. You know they were here four times longer than us, and they're gone. You know, and it's our turn now, and we'll and the Earth is still spinning. You know. So it, it, the earth's gonna be okay. We have to consider our own fate in this. So, uh, um, and I do believe that in the end, it's, it's, it's the natural order. I'm not worried about it or anything like that, but I, the work in a lot of ways addresses these very same issues. But, uh, um, um, but I'm not beating you over the head with it. I said, if you can find it, if it's a mirror, you should be able to find it, right? And your truth in it, that is, you know? My truth is my truth, you know? But, they're numbered for that reason, so that you could find yourself in it. So, yeah. Do you have another question? Or yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't no, let, let her go. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering. Um, Closer, babe. Closer. Yeah, I was wondering what were, what was one of the most surprising um, reactions or responses you have gotten from the audience or even um, the art world? As you had, um, as you have shown your artwork in many different countries or in the globe. Right. Well, the question was surprising reaction to my shows in general or his work in particular. Right. Which we answer both. I have. It was a question for uh, Mr. Drew. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, my the, the, the the most surprising question. The, the, action, the action. Yours. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, um, 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 I'm like, I still stump. You know, I'll try to answer that question. But it's like surprising question. Surprising reactions. Reaction. Oh, oh. That's a good one. Okay, let's see. Well, I mean, look at those Instagram images. You know, I was surprised by that because, you know, the idea that that, that uh, there's complicity, there's this uh, thing shared between um, bodies and uh, if I, I didn't know that my work could bring those kind of like, you know, uh, reactions, you know, but it's nonstop. It's not like those guys were speaking to each other, but it was like they felt it, they saw it, and they reacted to it. Um, when I did my um, first outdoor sculpture, uh, uh, I did not know that people were going to sort of like, you know, want to climb on it and read on it and sit on it and become a part of it. But, you know, the fact is if, you know, like a, 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 you can make these things, but you can't really control the finishing of it. The finishing of it is you, you know, the viewer, how you in, indeed relate to, the, uh, relate to these works, uh, whether or not I'm embedding these things in there, I can't even know that. It's like I can only know after the fact that, you know, wow, look what that body is doing because they're, they're feeling the work in that way. I mean, I don't jump in front of it like that. 
and, and do somersaults and you know, do things like that, but they, they feel the need to do that, you know? And I just need to get out of the way and allow that, you know? I think in terms of the, the question I'm often asked at these exhibitions around the country, because for me, it's, uh, the collection's all about the art and the audience. Uh, I have no sense of ownership. Uh, I have 13 people who work full-time in the 56,000 warehouse in Portland. John should organize a tour for any of you to come on up, and we'll give you a tour of the 4,000-foot exhibition space we have in front of the warehouse. But often what I'm asked, and, and I love getting work to especially less-served communities. Like Kara Walker, I had her go to Laramie, Wyoming, Springfield, Missouri, especially a lot of white places. That know, but I mean, the, the Global Asia show that's traveling, the uh, women's show that started at the National Museum of the Arts in Washington, D.C. have been to five locations. We've got a, all these shows. Is people sometimes say, not a erudite audience like you, ugh, this abstract art, why can't these people just paint some nice bowls of fruit and portraits? And I'll say, well, most all of these artists in our collection went to art school, and they painted plenty of portraits and plenty of bowls of fruit. <laughs> but I said, a couple things have to happen to get on the walls of this museum. I said, you know, everyone here, we all took art in grade school, high school, some of you are artists, but, but to, to rise up above what most of us do, doodling on a paper at a restaurant when we've got some time, is first, I think you've got to have a genetic predisposition to a style. Some people have a, a, to an aesthetic. Some people dress better than others. So he was born, in this case, as a child prodigy with this, this, this ability to, to use his hands and create things that most of us would have a harder time with. Second, you've got to have a burning issue inside you, a passion that you're willing to rip open your guts and do work that lets all of us criticize and talk about. And third, you've got to do it in a different way. In terms of the audience, what I suggest to people is it's interesting you know, we hear some music, right? And we get into the vibe, whatever. Well, unless you're really a musician, you don't think about the six tenths or whatever, how is it mixed or all the complicated things. We just like it. You go to a restaurant, you try some new food. God, you love it. Unless you're really a, a real restaurant person, well, what temperature, butter, this, that, how they mix it, whatever. But somehow with visual things, when we see something, we don't understand it instantly, we feel threatened in some way and we get aggravated. So the main thing I tell all the audience, because I don't tell you, but everyone is, stop when you're, when you're looking at art, stop thinking and just start feeling. Just let your, turn off the brain that tells you what is it, what's going on, just start feeling it. And if there's an artist that does amazing things that just seduces you wonderfully and sucks you into the work, it's Leonardo Drew. Yes, a number of his pieces have a strong theme to them. Others, it's whatever you want to see in them. And he's gotten your attention by doing these amazing constructions and things. And once he's got your attention, then the magic of all of us with our heart and soul and mind takes off experiencing the wonderful things that you do. So thank you for being the artist you are and being here.